Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the 360 students and the 260 students. Since we've got um, canceled class this week on Tuesday, I'm recording this video to make up for our lost class <laughs> this week and I think it's going to be very important for us to keep the momentum going. So um, to offset that loss, um, I am recording this video uh, so that we can get through some more material. And I'm uh, saddened <laughs> by how we're not going to be able to do this unit in person together because I think uh, just like we saw with our introduction to the ethical crash course there can be a lot of questions um, like especially big picture questions about what we're up to when we're first heading into a new style of theorizing or or territory for theoretical analysis and that and that's what's happening right now we're transitioning from uh, general considerations of ethics to those that attach uh, specifically to the context of the business world um, and I am so happy that we're doing this uh, I'm very excited to get going on the main body of material for this class but as I think um, you're seeing right out of the gates with this piece by Hasnas um, who is also addressing this question about a transition from general ethical theory to the specific context of uh, ethical questions in the business world um, it still does rely on the theoretical stuff. So a lot of the ideas um, that Hasnas brings up as a part of evaluating these theories of business ethics specifically, the stockholder theory, the stakeholder theory, and the social contract theory, it relies on a lot of concepts and, and reasoning that you saw uh, expressed in these classical theories. So hopefully uh, the class is already out of the gates here. Uh, demonstrating um, the rationale behind my choice of curriculum. <laughs> but if you want to talk more about that, I'm, of course, I'm happy to always do that. Um, one other thing I want to say before we get started here, um, with this transition, it's also changing the way the class is structured and running. And I, I tried to give you a very exhaustive weekend update email this last weekend um, to help you prepare for this and, and just to mark very clearly and explicitly how we're shifting gears a, a little bit. This crash course was pretty informal. Um, I didn't have any officially assigned readings that were mandatory, and it seems like my my best sense from talking with all of you is that um, very few people were reading any of the optional readings. And that's okay. I gave you that option, um, but it's definitely going to feel different if you're if you haven't been doing any reading and now you're uh, picking it up because now the readings are mandatory. Um, and uh, there are mandatory assignments related to them, and I'm speaking of the reading comment assignments. And I just want to undergird again how um, those reading comment assignments, I'm not going to be as flexible with accepting late work. Um, those are important to have done on the due date because they're connected with being prepared for class and, and a check on actually doing the readings. So uh, I will only accept reading comments late, for excused absences, like if you're sick or something like that, then of course I'll take your like your your work late. Um, but otherwise I won't. Uh, so those will be zeros. So please stay on top of that. It's very easy to uh, put this stuff off. Um, just from talking with some of you about reasons why you haven't been able to do the optional readings um, because of busyness and stuff like that. Um, I expect those conditions will probably continue. I know that some of them were uh, contingent on the tax season and all that kind of thing. Thinking mostly uh, for you 360 students um, that there, there was a busy time for your jobs. Um, but uh, please, I, I just, I'm speaking to this because this class does uh, require some commitment. This is a difficult class and it's asking for quite a lot. And I think it's important to respect that and stay on top of that um, to be able to uh, be as successful as I, I hope you will be uh, this quarter. If you have concerns about this, if you want someone to talk to, I'm always happy to talk to you about that. I do not take it personally. Um, if you want to um, share with what's going on with you in the class and if there's anything I can do to help support you in what I do think is a pretty challenging course uh, on balance here. Um, this class is philosophy. Sometimes either it's it's weird how this happens. So there's like misconceptions that it's either way more difficult 
um, than it actually is, like that it's only for super genius people or something like that. And if you're not like a philosopher, then it'll be impossible. I don't think that's true. Um, I think it can be accessible uh, even to people who are not gunning for a philosophy major or something like that. But also, uh, the, in the sort of weird ways, sometimes the impression is it goes in the opposite direction. That philosophy classes are really easy, and they're just about opinions, and there's like no rigor to it. And hopefully at this point you can see that's not true either. Um, but let me know how things are going for you in the class. And um, I, I just... I told you I'd be a broken record about this, but I'm going to be again because um, so far this quarter, not many students have reached out outside of class to talk to me. Um, and I expect a, a usual amount would be more than this. And even when it's a normal amount, I'm always like, more, more. <laughs> like, um, if you're ever feeling really lost with what's going on or you don't know how to approach being a student in this class, um, or what uh, you're expected to do or things like that, please reach out to me. I'm very, very happy to have those conversations. And again, I won't take them personally. Um, even with all the careful preparations that I've done this quarter in terms of articulating expectations and giving you a sense of what's going on with assignments and the tools of argumentation and debate, like with the code, I know that there's still that's not going to answer all the questions. And there can be things that are idiosyncratic to you personally that might be hang-ups and I'm really happy to to hear about your experience and talk with you about it and do offer anything I can um, to help you uh, get the most out of this class that you can this quarter um, my uh, little one is supposed to be taking a nap and is not so I'm gonna pause this video check in with him and then I'm gonna continue sorry for the interruption sorry again for the interruption all right so let's um, let's get into this uh, and let me do a little bit of framing for Hasnas uh, himself and the sort of the framing here of this first issue um, that I'm calling fiduciary duty. Um, this debate is really, it, it could be rightfully said that it's the central ethical controversy in business ethics. Uh, we looked at a couple topics in ethics generally that I described as gate issues. One of them was relativism. The other one was uh, egoism. And the reason I, I call them gate issues is because depending on how those debates are resolved, there may not be any point to doing any other further ethical inquiry or ethical debate. It might be pointless. I was saying we might as well just pack our bags and go home kind of thing if certain answers to those, uh, those debates are given. In a similar way, um, with this fiduciary duty debate, there's a question of like, do businesses have any ethical obligations that would force them to ask some of these deeper questions about how they ought to be run? And in short, to kind of do a little foreshadowing here, if stockholder theory is correct, then there really isn't anything that managers and employees have to be concerned about when they're doing their jobs, other than, in most cases, uh, maximizing profit. That that can be the like sole purpose. Um, a lot of times when we think of the idea of business ethics, we think that the way in which the business world is primarily concerned with profit is something potentially morally problematic. And the question is what other things need to be brought in as priorities um, and to what extent is the, the concern for profit seeking uh, to be minimized. Right? And that creates a bunch of messes, honestly. like It makes things very controversial um, if we're opening up that space. And one of the things that um, may even be attractive about stockholder theory is that saying, you don't even have to bother with all that stuff. I've had some students in the past who have just been totally honest and candid and said, I like stockholder theory because it means I don't have to think about ethics more, <laughs> which is not a good reason to endorse the theory. Um, one thing I'm going to be trying to emphasize here that I think Hasnas and even Friedman do a good job about here is recognizing that the stockholder theory is not the anti-ethics position. It is itself an ethical theory. It's just one that isn't going to maybe put us on, under as many obligations or create an ethical mandate for why we have to be concerned about some of these other ethical controversies. So um, that's why we're starting with this topic and pursuing it first.
Um, so, um, sorry, I'm going to have to pause the video one more time. Um, so that that's why we're doing this topic first. Okay. Um, the the other big thing, yeah, let's go with this next. So I, I one of the reasons I chose Hosnos first is that um, Hosnos is going to be giving us a kind of survey of this topic, of this debate around fiduciary duty. With Friedman and Boatwright, you're going to see two philosophers arguing for really particular answers in that debate. So it's it's more opinionated. Although, as you know, I, I kind of have an axe to grind here about the whole calling something an opinion. Like, everything we believe is an opinion. But there's a distinction here between supported opinion and unsupported opinion. So it's not like it's just their opinions. But Friedman and Boatwright are going to give arguments. They're going to attempt to support uh, their opinions and in how to resolve this debate around fiduciary duty. Hasnas is giving us more of a survey. Now, I will say it is with an edge to it. Like, Hasnas has a horse in this race, and he's pretty open about it, um, pretty explicit about it. In fact, so explicit that he's like, I want you to know what I'm doing here. Like, I am doing this a little bit, but I'm not going this far. Like, he says, it might seem as though his article is really defending stockholder theory, and he doesn't intend that to be the case. Not like the way Friedman's going to be arguing for it. Um, but there is a, um, th this happens in philosophy, that even when you're trying to give a survey of positions, every survey is done in a kind of framing. And we can ask whether that framing is itself built on assumptions that are themselves controversial and stand in need of justification. So what you're going to get, um, Hosnost is framing this up in a certain way and giving an analysis of what's happening in the debate um, without really picking a side or anything like that, but is still expressing a perspective. As I go through my lecture on Hosnost, I'll be giving some criticism about that and trying to point out where he is adding something and where there are other things that are happening in the debate that don't get onto his radar. But as a, as a kind of uh, a reading for us to kind of get a handle and in entering into this debate, I think Cosnos isn't bad. Uh, I just will have some, some of my own criticisms I'll bring up along the way. Kind of similar to how um, I really like the Code of Intellectual Conduct and yet I still had some suggestions for improvements with it. Um, I, I'm not a fan of Hasnas, I wouldn't say that, but I do think that his summary is not bad. And he does a good job of highlighting some of the misconceptions that can make this debate um, more confusing or that generate misunderstanding between the various parties in the debate. Um, so that was another reason I selected this article. But watch out for that. I mean, Hasnas still has a, an angle, we could say. And we just need to look at the arguments he provides for that and critically think for ourselves about this. Okay. Um, so there's going to be three um, major theories we're going to talk about here. Stockholder, stakeholder, and social contract theory. Um, but before we even get into this, let's talk about the question itself. And it's usually framed around this idea of social responsibility. And I think Hosnas' uh, definitions and sensitivity to misunderstanding here is really solid. So uh, here's the quote that he has. The social responsibility will define as those ethical obligations, if any, that businesses or business persons have to expend business resources in ways that do not promote the specific purposes for which the business is organized. There's some advantages to this definition. Um, first off, uh, it's locating for us what the question of fiduciary duty is. Who is it a question for? And it's really not a question for owners. And that's important um, to distinguish what, a, what the stockholder's responsibility is, for example, as opposed to the managers who run a business. Um, I w when we get together next time, maybe we can talk about, like, how does a small business owner fit into this debate? You know, because they are simultaneously complete owner and manager of that business. Um, does that uh, make some of these arguments irrelevant? Cat out of the bag, I don't think it does. I think this stuff all applies for a small business owner too, but it, it sort of changes how the story will be talked about a little bit. But when we're thinking about fiduciary duty, we're primarily thinking about employees of a company. And 
mostly we're thinking about upper management. So like CEOs and stuff like that. The people are really calling the shots at the business. Now we can extend the same debate to middle management and even like on the line employees. That can happen too. Basically anyone who is entrusted with responsibilities related to how the business operates has a question about how do they uh, how do they fulfill those responsibilities? What are they going to do with that power that is entrusted to them? The way that they are calling the shots on something related to how the business operates. If you're in middle management or on the line, it's not like you have complete control because you are given directives by the managers above you. Um, but there is still some uh, choices to be made there in terms of uh, how there's a logical space that's left open that is to the discretion of the lower employee even if the higher manager employee is still setting some of the context like giving orders right but also there's a question of like obeying those orders <laughs> like what if you're um, if you have a theory of business ethic um, then you would have a standard by which to figure out whether the orders you're being given by your superiors are in fact ethical business practice. And if they're not, then you might have some obligations about what to do there. More on that in our next unit next week on whistleblowing. That's when we'll focus on that facet to this whole situation. But it all starts with the fiduciary duty debate. So this is a lot of the themes we're going to talk about this week are and in this unit are going to come back time and time again and be relevant for other debates too. Um, so that's why we're starting with this. Um, okay. Sorry, I just had to sneeze. Um, all right. So this question for, we, we, know, we now have the who. What is the what? Um, I already kind of talked about this with the idea of like how does uh, an employee utilize the power and responsibilities what do they see as the responsibilities for how they manage whatever they've been given to manage and that's where we get the idea of a fiduciary duty um, maybe you've heard this phrase before it's possible I know some of you um, in the 360 class I think have taken um, biomedical ethics before and I'm almost 100% positive although who knows the curriculum you had for that class but it's very likely that you got into fiduciary topics in biomed ethics too because this is a it, the, the fidu a fiduciary duty in the abstract merely refers to this idea of uh, the obligations that are incurred by playing the role of holding something in trust for another person oh no my son is not taking his nap I can hear the banging <sighs> it's frustrating for me um, thankfully you watching the video don't have to be interrupted because I'll just pause the video but my apologies for the break all right here we go again so fiduciary duties holding something in trust for somebody else let's talk about some examples of some very ordinary things like this um, parents have a fiduciary duty to their children um, they we, we acknowledge the uh, intrinsic value and rights of all people, including for issues of autonomy and freedom. Um, but until the child is in a position where they can be self-determining, kind of like some stuff we talked about with Kant uh, last week, um, until that they arrive at that place, the parent makes the decisions for them. But the child is not just the, an extension of the parent's uh, will or their personhood or something like that. Um, the idea of parenting as a fiduciary relationship is that the parent is making decisions on behalf of the child, like as if as their agent, you might say. So normally we would say, and take the biomedical ethics case, people have the moral right and we have a value on autonomy that they people ought to be able to make decisions about what health care they receive. Um, rather than having those decisions made for them without their consent. Um, children aren't able yet to operate that way, um, mostly because they, in order to be able to make an autonomous choice, you need to be informed, and the child can understand the choice that is before them with at least some medical decisions. And so the parent makes it, but not based on what the parent would 
necessarily choose for themselves, but as sort of a proxy for the child, thinking about the child for their own interests, not what procedure does the parent want for the child for the parent's interests, right? This goes back to Kant's idea of treating people as ends in themselves instead of simply as a means. But the, the parent is specifically given this entrusting role. Or, for example, um, if a parent extends that duty and obligation of being the fiduciary for the children, they, they might hand off or outsource that fiduciary duty to, say, a babysitter, right? A babysitter is a fiduciary, uh, holding the care for the children in trust for the parents. And so they're under certain obligations. A babysitter can't just parent the children how they would parent them, but how the parents want, it, want the child to be um, parented, like as an extension of their autonomy. So there are many cases like this. Or a really simple case would be... Um, if uh, I had a bike and I let you borrow it, like I'm letting you assume ownership and control over the bike, but there still is a way in which it is mine and you're just holding it in trust for me. Like under the arrangements of the permission, you're going to give it back to me, right? If I just give it to you, then it's a gift, right? But if I give you permission to use my bike, um, there are certain obligations that you would be under even though you're given temporary, temporary control over the bike. For example, you couldn't say to me, hey Tim, can I borrow your bike? And I'm like, sure, go ahead. And then you go and pawn it. And then I, you come back and I'm like, where's my bike? And you're like, well, I pawned it. Um, and you're like, what? <laughs> right? I'm like, I understand that I gave you temporary ownership over the bike, but not absolutely, not to do anything that you want with the bike. Um, in a similar way, if I um, let you borrow my bike, and then you used it dangerously or negligently, and uh, like some kind of risky bike thing that I am not aware of, or something that like you didn't clear with me first, and the bike is destroyed, you know, you have some liability there, okay? Um, that would be a kind of fiduciary duty as well. Um, when something is entrusted for somebody else. Now, in the business world, fiduciary duty get, has been talked about. You might have heard it on the, just talked about more recently because there was a uh, Obama-era regulation that went into effect, I think, three years ago um, that mandated that all, um, all investment advising has this fiduciary relationship and it used to be that there were options here that like a financial advisor like maybe a hedge fund manager or something like that was not under a specific fiduciary duty to their clients in other words they were not legally obligated to work to the advantage of their clients some people were and registered as fiduciaries and it used to be that one of the best pieces of investment advice um, that I've heard, and I'm not very well versed in this stuff, but it came up a lot, was that if you're going to get advice from someone about how to invest, first ask them if they are a fiduciary, if they have that legal status, um, before going any further. Because the, the other option is basically these advisors are just salespeople. Um, very often they would be making money from certain companies to basically pimp their stocks. Um, and they didn't have to disclose that when offering consumers financial advice about what to invest in or something like that. Um, so they're not working with the best interests of the client in mind as they are working for their own best interests and the interests of the people who are trying to sell their stock. Um, so that's a pretty big difference, right? If someone is, if you're uh, garnering the services of someone who's giving you advice about investment, and they're under a fiduciary duty, that is, they are supposed to be operating with respect to your finances in a way that's looking out for your best interests or not. That's a pretty big deal. But ever since this Obama-era regulation, now that is mandatory. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, okay, we're getting to a little breaking point here. So um, this comes up for the issue with managers because, in a way... The manager is given this control over at least some part, even if you're a low-level employee, 
you're given responsibility over some part of the business's operation and yet you don't own it right the stockholders own it they they're the ones who really own the company the employees are just working there but they're the ones that are given these choices to make they're given the power of what's going to happen with the business so now the question is what to do with that so what fiduciary obligations are managers under that's the topic we're getting into okay I'm gonna have to deal with this again the next thing to say on the topic of the fiduciary duty um, that is important for clarifying the debate here between these different theories is how all of them agree that there is a fiduciary duty of managers to owners or to stockholders um, everyone agrees that 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 there is some kind of responsibility involved there there are some obligations um, a person is under when they're hired to do the job um, the real disagreement is not about whether a fiduciary duty exists but what is its moral shape <laughs> that's a way I could put this you remember my metaphor about the moral landscape and like having a theory as like a map that's trying to chart what those what that landscape looks like what these theories disagree about what they say as maps is they say the landscape is very different um, now which one is the true one I mean that's what we have to get into a critical debate about but um, and there are arguments here that are gonna lean on the theories that we just finished studying and their ultimate source of justification by proxy but they're all saying something different about where the fiduciary duty sits in the overall landscape of ethical business practice. So just like Kazanov says at the beginning of the paper, the reason we need a theory of business ethics is to serve as sort of a bridge between the general moral obligations of the big theories, which are not uncontroversial, which are themselves you know, there's a lot of controversies that happens there that's what we've been doing with our ethical theory crash course and then the kind of practical on the ground choices that people in the business world have to make one of my favorite things about Haznas's whole paper is the way how he describes um, how those ethical theories need help to translate into the practical sphere but also that they need to be translated <laughs> and his argument is that if you don't have ethical theories in the background then there is absolutely zero accountability for the choices that people make practically um, at least when it comes to ethical accountability because you might say well of course the business world is full of accountability because if you run the company poorly you're gonna get fired and things like that yeah that's true people have standards but are those the right standards is that the way things is that does that exhaust everything that people should be tracking about um, whether someone should be rightfully given this authority and influence and in the position the job that they have or not um, is it just a matter of profit if so then even people who are doing deeply unethical things that are making money for their companies are doing just fine like Martin Screlly <laughs> from the pharmaceutical scandals that you may have heard about I mean he's generating more profit for his company um, but in a way that seems utterly abhorrent when looked at from moral standards of exploiting an already vulnerable population um, and basically holding them over a barrel of their own life um, in order to we might say extort money from them but a lot of capitalism is loosely described as extortion but there's just some forms that we think are more okay and others that are not or you know where are those lines that's part of what a theory is needed in order to figure out what the standards ought to be and it can't just be a derivative of how the standards are to make practical considerations completely drive the car of how a business should operate is basically to say ethics doesn't matter at all it's an amoral um, pers perspective or way of operating or living at that point um, okay I hear pitter patter of little feet again. Um, okay, let's talk about our first theory, the stockholder theory. And we're going to describe what the, I've got these like summaries of the reading here in my lecture notes I'll be using as a roadmap here. But we're going we're gonna to do some clarification about just what 
the theory uh, is talking about, like what it what its position is. We're going to talk about how it might be justified, and then what are some problems with it. Hasnas is going to help with all of this, and then I'm going to kind of supplement um, with what Hasnas is saying as well uh, to try to give you a picture of what's happening here in this debate. So the stockholder theory is the one that Milton Friedman subscribes to. We're going to have a whole other paper from him on the subject. But the basic idea of the stockholder theory is that the stockholder theory views managers as agents of the stockholders. So it's like the stockholders give control of the company to the manager with the trust that they're going to do what the stockholders want with it. So the, the obligation the manager is under is to basically obey the wishes of the stockholders. And whatever they say, that's what they're going to be doing. So what's interesting about this is that it's saying this is the ethical obligation of the manager and it's exclusive, which means there's no logical space left for the manager to use the resources of the company for some objective that isn't ultimately pursuing the end or the purposes that the stockholders have for the company. So, <clears throat> of course, the manager is going to have to make their own judgment calls for what specific policies and actions to take. But those, those little mini projects are all done with an aim toward the ultimate project that the stockholders have set up as the mandate for the company's existence. Um, the sort of the purpose of the firm. So um, in many cases, the purpose there is profit. That what the st stockholders want is the company to be run in a way which generates more profit for them. So that that sets the ultimate end. Um, and anything that deviates from that, in other words, use of company resources that don't end up maximizing profits would actually be unethical. <laughs> so for like the company to... <clears throat> exert social responsibility, that is, to expend business resources in ways that do not provoke, promote the specific purposes for which the business is organized, are unethical. So under the stockholder theory, there is no room for social responsibility. In, in, in most cases where the purpose is set by profit, that's not exclusive, but in many cases it does work that way, then if the CEO of the company wanted to do something like um, take efforts to minimize the impact of the environment um, or wanted to um, maybe like if they're a pharmaceutical company like make drugs available to um, lower income uh, customers that don't actually end up increasing the bottom line for the business those kinds of actions would be unethical not just it's like Oh, you, the business doesn't have to do these nice, benevolent things for the rest of society. It's that a manager who chooses to do so is actually violating their moral obligations under the stockholder theory. And that's why the stockholder theory <clears throat> is not an amoral theory. It is a moral theory. It's saying, here are the boundaries of the obligations that managers are under. So there, there can just be no social responsibilities uh, for employees under the stockholder theory, given this thesis. Okay, so a couple good clarifications here. The theory is not saying that the employee's duties are limited to turning a profit um, because the binding obligation is to the stockholder's purposes. So if the stockholders want anything else to happen, then that's the thing that um, the manager would be responsible for. So I like this. I, I think this way of carving it up and framing the debate is exactly appropriate because we can talk about fiduciary duties for managers of nonprofits like uh, basically businesses with but not in that name a firm an institution that um, a person does not own but is given control of uh, a manager of a nonprofit it's not their nonprofit they're just the ones managing it and they have duties to the people who are bankrolling it that are owning it that are um, you know the resource the people who own the resources that that nonprofit is using Um, so there's ways that we can talk about violations of fiduciary duty there too. It's not like if, if it, just because something is a nonprofit and you become the manager of it, now you can run it however you want for whatever purpose you want. Um, that wouldn't be ethical either. And this allows us to say why, right? This this um, 
more careful definition of social responsibility allows us to talk about fiduciary duty in the case of nonprofits. However, most of the time in the business world, the implicit um, intention here is that the stockholders want a return on their investment. So that's what's setting the purpose. More on this topic with Boatwright. Boatwright's going to dig into this uh, quite a bit, so we'll have some more to say about it there. Um, the other thing that the theory is uh, d could be misconstrued about is that it's not allowing the employee to do or requiring that the employee do whatever it takes to turn a profit. Um, the, there is, of course, the binding obligations of the law. So the, the stockholder theory acknowledges that. Like the stockholder theory is saying you still have to play within the rules, right? Um, and one of the things that sets those rules is the law. But these are about the general obligations that everything in the society has to the government. Um, and then it, almost all stockholder theorists put something in here too about uh, that there's some kind of constraint on honest business or fair business or non-deceptive practices or something like that. You'll see Friedman mention the same thing. And pretty much every stockholder theorist I've ever come across has some kind of provision like that in their theory as well. But this is not as clear. Like it's easy to see where the authority of legal obligations come from. Um, they extend from the legitimacy of the government. If the government is illegitimate, then you know the laws don't have to be obeyed. But as long as the government is a legitimate one, then there are moral reasons for this. And that comes back to a social contract, which we'll actually be talking about a little bit later here, applied to businesses. But the social contract theory, when it was a, a initially created, was really a question about the legitimacy of governments, the kinds of social institutions that are governments. Like, do we have obligations to obey the law? And the answer is yes, provisionally. <laughs> That's how social contract works, that like, yeah, we, we give the government some authority over us, um, but it's not like it's a blank check. There are moral and ethical obligations the government has that if they don't fulfill, they lose their legitimacy and thus their authority. And this is where you get someone like John Locke and the idea of civil disobedience, which is a big part of the history of America, that like if the government has unjust laws, then it's actually the responsibility of citizens to disobey those laws and not follow them uh, if they are unjust or if the government that issues them is unjust. Um, so in a similar way, we could talk about that being the backdrop for the reason why the stockholder theory would be justified in making constraints here on employees' actions that respect the law. But what about this part about honest business? That's a lot trickier. And just as a little two cents from Tim here, I'm a little worried that the stockholder theory isn't really comfortable going full hog on its thesis. <laughs> that it's saying, like, the only obligations managers are under derive from the intentions of the stockholders. Um, and they can't have any other obligations that don't derive from the mandate that they're given by the owners. But then why, where would this be justified? Um, it's not, not that it isn't unintelligible to put these constraints on there, but if, if really the stockholder theory is denying that there could be no other ethical sensitivities that inform the choices of the manager, then why do they have to respect these things? It's a big question. In, and the, putting some uh, constraint like this in there may just be wishful thinking, that the stockholder theorist doesn't want to violate um, these sorts of intuitions about what acceptable business would look like. They don't want to sign up for saying and giving a moral endorsement on like totally underhanded business dealings or something like that. Um, but I think they may end up contradicting their own position here. That That's at least my concern about it, that there just isn't the logical room for justifying these extra conditions that are put in there. Or if they want to, then they're opening the door for other types of social responsibilities too, depending on how they try to cash that out. Okay, so um, how would this theory get justified? And th there's some tangents here I don't want to get too distracted by. Um, Hosnas is right that this that stockholder theory has been kind of historically connected to a endorsement of free market laissez-faire capitalism. 
that this is a good way for society to be organized. Um, and and the, the arguments that are usually offered for the justification of laissez-faire free market capitalism um, have been historically given by Adam Smith as one of the really good examples of this, which offer this kind of consequentialist argument that if everyone in the business world is pursuing self-interest and profit maximizing, that actually is ultimately going to help everybody. It's going to make for a more efficient market, um, which means that the, the resources that are available are being used to their maximum effect in giving people benefit, which is the underlying, I don't know how many of you have taken some economics, but this is the underlying logic behind supply and demand setting prices for things. Um, this is um, something you may have heard about as the invisible hand, um, that basically the, the best chance for everyone to be as happy as they possibly can be is from everyone solely pursuing their own self-interest in a competitive marketplace with freedom to, of people to consent or to not consent to any transaction. Um, now, that's uh, very, very um, controversial, and as Hasnas points out, no one's really buying that anymore. <laughs> Most, I've met a ton of economists who are just completely skeptical of this neoclassical capitalist economic theory, um, that it isn't really going to work this way. Um, but uh, there's another way that the stockholder theory can defend itself and that's not with a consequentialist slash utilitarian style argument that look this structure for society just makes the most sense it's going to do the most good uh, and the least harm it's going to maximize utility but rather to to treat it as a deontic duty now i've used the word deontic to refer to kant's ethics and to use that word is just to say that it's it's an ethical system that's concerned with justice that there are obligations or rights um, and duties and morality is a matter of respecting those things and not violating them. Um, and that I, idea, I mean, even for Kant, one of the most classic types of deontic duties is promise making and promise keeping. That kind of honesty and sincerity that if you make a promise, you follow through on it. So the stockholder theory is seeing that there's this kind of agreement between the employee and the stockholders that they're like, we're, we will give you control of what is ours as long as you do what we want you to do with it. And when the employee takes the job, they're basically saying, yep, I agree to that. And now they're under the obligation to fulfill that promise. So I do think that Hasnas is right, that the uh, deontic defense of stockholder theory as a way to justify why should we think this theory is correct fits much more naturally to what the theory is actually proposing than this uh, consequentialist argument. And is probably the more plausible option of the two, given how uh, this consequentialist argument just doesn't seem to be factually correct. <laughs> that even the economists who are not ethicists are just like, yeah, this isn't what's happening. This isn't the the predictions of neoclassical economics are just false. That they thought that markets work in this way, and they just don't. Um, okay. So. Um, Hasnas, in, in kind of evaluating it, he, he mentions that he has a little bit of an axe to grind here about how stockholder theory isn't given a fair shake, that it's dismissed as absurd a lot of the time. Um, and he gives some quotations to that effect. So he talks about how, uh, especially this part about that, the, you know, he has that list of quotes of people just like trashing stockholder theory, um, that it's viewed as uncompassionate, that it's amoral. And I think... Hasnas is right that sometimes these criticisms are uh, treating the theory as a straw man. Not taking seriously that this is a sincere moral theory. I mean, it's not saying don't worry about morality. It's really saying you can't worry about these other moral considerations because of these moral considerations. The fiduciary duty to the stockholders is central and exhaustive. Um, that's really the position, which is a moral argument. Um, Hasnas also uh, thinks that a lot of the criticism or, or animosity toward this theory comes from uh, the skepticism around the consequentialist argument. I don't know if that's super true. I mean, I, like I said, I do know that no one's really buying Adam Smith's Kool-Aid anymore about the invisible hand. 
Um, although you will still definitely see politicians talk this way, and plenty of people, but serious economists, um, you'll you'll find some that are on that are still arguing for that. But uh, many, it, it's just so controversial at this point, and um, most most of what I've seen from the economics world is that no, this is this is just not true it's a it's a fantasy um and that the modeling like the economic modeling that happens here with like game theoretic systems only happens because of a bunch of assumptions it's a kind of artificial system that doesn't fit with how people actually are and how they actually work um there's another point though that we don't really live in a free market so in some ways um it's kind of a moot point whether businesses today managers and businesses today should work this way for the reasons of promoting the the uh, general good by operating selfishly that would only the even for adam smith's setup here if we we're going to just kind of grant everything for the sake of argument with his assumptions it only works in a really deregulated environment and that's not where we're at right now we don't live in a total free market economy um it's a weird hybrid system at this point. It's it's kind of like um, uh, China and Hong Kong, <laughs> where it's like pseudo capitalism, right? Like sort of, but not totally. I mean, we're not as far on that end of the spectrum as China is, but we're definitely not over here in Adam Smith's uh, libertarian paradise. That's not happening. Um, so. In some ways, it just doesn't even mention, it doesn't even matter practically to bring up this kind of argument without also advocating for a complete rehauling of all of society um, that would make that actually, that consequence actually occur. Okay. But what about for the deontic defense? Um, Haznas, I think, may be guilty of strawmanning the concerns here. And I'm going to try to supplement his arguments but the way he frames it up is to say well okay given this uh promise making promise keeping fiduciary duty thing for a manager to spend or use company resources for a social responsibility um basically is to use the company's resources in a way that goes outside of the mandate of consent that is given by the owners, the stockholders. Okay, so the question of whether that's okay or not comes down to is it okay to spend other people's money without their consent if it's for a beneficent end like the public good? So uh, that would be a possible objection here is to say actually it is okay for that to happen and there's precedent for it. It's called the government, right? The government spends people's money without their consent. Now, in some ways, I think that's a little extreme because of, well, social contract theory for governments, um, where we, live, we do live in a democratic republic, and that means people do have some say in what happens here. There is some consent that's involved. Not total consent, because not every government decision is run as a referendum through the voters, but to say that there's absolutely no connection here is, is probably hyperbole. Um, unless you have a very cynical view of American democracy, in which case the Russians have won. And no, <laughs> but I do kind of feel that way. Um, I don't think, I mean, things are, I don't think things are great for democracy in America, but I don't think that they are also completely corrupted and that they're, that democracy is entirely dead or something like that. But we could have that debate outside of class if you're interested. Um, it's an it's that kind of analogy that Hasnas is using to try to motivate this opponent who's going to object to defending the stockholder theory on deontic grounds this, to really put the attention on this promise making promise keeping responsibility. So the first thing that Hasnas says in reply to this objection to try to help defend the stockholder theory, like what can they say, is to remind the objector that the whole idea of deontic duties is that they're they're supposed to have this binding force um, despite whatever consequences. So if I have an obligation to keep my promises, I'm supposed to have that obligation regardless of whether following through on that promise making actually ends up doing the most good. Um, 
Now, that's logically correct. <laughs> it's true that deontic duties, like when Kant's saying, like, um, to do your moral duty, to do what's necessarily good, follow the moral law, uh, does not have the end of happiness. Happiness is not the point of morality. Um, but it still is a secondary duty, right? But it's not... Um, the, the whole idea of there being a moral law is that it's what you have to do even if it would be expedient to break the law, okay? Um, so that's where this whole idea of deontic duties hold in spite of the consequences is supposed to come from that. Um, same way that it's like you can't harvest the the person experiencing homelessness's organs at the that late night ER setting just because it would do more good, right? Of saving more lives, that's still morally wrong. Why? Because you have duties to respect people's rights to life, no matter what. And it's also the logic behind Kant saying you can't treat people as a means solely instead of as an end even if it's for some kind of beneficent purpose. People are not tools, and you always have to respect them, no matter what. Um, so, Hasnas is right to point out that deontic duties have this form. However, um, the there's another thing that happens very often in deontic systems like Kant's, or that are similar, the Kantian-style moral theories, which is that you could have multiple duties that conflict. And all of them taken individually, seem to have that kind of binding force where you're like I'm so I have to do this but then you find a situation where two of those imperatives contradict each other and then what are you supposed to do I think what Hasnas might be missing here is forgetting that this can that this can happen and that we do have duties and obligations for concern for people's well-being that we're entrusted with them like doctors being entrusted as a fiduciary for their patients right and that's concern about consequences because it's about people's health, but it also takes, it's a part that the, the concern about consequences is embedded within a duty relationship um, and an, oblig an obligation maxim, right? A, a maxim that has obligatory force on you. So um, these are normal. Uh, these are classic problems that any deontic theory is going to have to deal with. And to say that there is a deontic duty, therefore it must hold no matter what else, is kind of absurd to me. If we are talking about a fundamental moral law, sure, right? Like an unconditional maxim, like a categorical imperative, like we talked about with Kant. Those kinds of things can't have exceptions to them. But for anything else, anything that's like a contingent duty, that could conflict with another contingent duty, and you're going to need some principle to tell you when and where does which one apply and which one takes precedence or priority over the other, right? If it's a choice between, um, oh, we'll be an example, like uh, fulfilling a promise to go see a movie with a friend <clears throat> or fulfilling my obligation to my child to take them to the emergency room because they injured themselves horribly, I'm going to pick the one that I'm going to respect my duty to my child, even if I made the promise to my friend to go see the movie before the accident happened, right? Um, so those duties can conflict, and we can talk about that. So just saying that there is a fiduciary duty to the stockholders doesn't automatically prove or entail that it's the only moral obligation the manager is under. So I think Hasnas is maybe a little misleading here. The second thing um, that Hasnas says is that the objection here uses a false analogy, that it's not appropriate to say, here's what's going on with the government, so this is what should be going on with a business, too. Um, and I think this is, could be a little bit better. Um, Hasnas appeals to this intuition that we have, that after we've made our required contribution to the public good by paying our taxes, then we're entitled to do whatever we want with our money after that point. Um, and so if we want to make a free agreements with other people about how we use the rest of the money that we have available to us, then fair enough, we should be allowed to do that. We basically have already fulfilled our social responsibilities by paying our taxes. Um, this might have some pull on you. We'll talk more about that feature of like, does paying taxes to the government fulfill your social obligations? Um, Hasnas, I, I say here in my lecture notes, Hasnas presents this as if it's not a final knockdown argument, and I think that's pretty wise in as much as I think we can imagine 
plenty of other cases that would be pretty strong counterexamples to this line of reasoning. That I, I, I shouldn't say things like, after I paid my taxes, now I don't need to be concerned with anybody else in society whatsoever. I'm under no moral obligations other than the ones that I've fulfilled by paying my taxes. That seems pretty goofy. Um, and if there's some kind of plausibility to this line of reasoning, it's probably going to need a lot of caveats before it's going to be immune to possible counterexamples like this. So that's why I say here, um, this is only the beginning of the debate. There's probably going to be other duties out there, and they might come into conflict with this, right? And and the sort of basic way in which we think we we do have private property rights. That that's a theme we'll talk about much later in this quarter when we get to social and econ economic justice. We'll talk about the morality of private property rights themselves. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the thing I do agree with Hasnas about here is that the fiduciary duty is not something dismissible. Um, and that's why I was saying at the outset here that in thinking about all three of these theories, it's not as though stockholder theory is the only one respecting the fiduciary duty. The thing that really defines the stockholder theory is that it's saying the fiduciary duty of the manager to the stockholders is the only obligation, the only thing that's defining of a moral obligation to what the manager is supposed to be doing in managing the business. Um, the other theories are going to say, yeah, fiduciary duty plus other duties too. Okay, so that's where the main point of disagreement is going to be. That's why the debate usually gets framed around do businesses have social responsibilities? Not that they should all businesses should exist as nonprofits that are extensions of the public good, um, but just that maybe there are other responsibilities that are sort of in balance with, say, the fiduciary responsibilities to increase profits for the shareholders, that kind of thing. Okay. I think Osnos is sometimes guilty of painting this debate as though the other theories may um, be ignoring that. Um, they, it, what is true is that they're not respecting that fiduciary duty with the intensity and single-minded focus of the stockholder theory, but it's not like they think this is something morally irrelevant, okay? And that's important. Okay. Um, next up, we've got the stakeholder theory, and this one is, is a very popular one. I'm going to take a short break here, use the restroom. All right, so talking about stakeholder theory, um, I think Hasnas does introduce a pretty important distinction here between stakeholder theory as it's presented as a theory of management versus as an ethical theory. That's a pretty important distinction here because you may have encountered the stakeholder theory as a theory of management. And here the claim is that just effective managers who basically people who are going to be good at maximizing profit for the company, um, that's best achieved by managers uh, thinking about balancing the concerns for the interests of all those who are affected by the operation of the business. Um, now that's a very wide sense here. Um, you could narrow it down and say they need to prioritize the interests of those who are vital to the success of the business. But either one of these... Um, Hasnas is right to point out this theory doesn't make room for social responsibility. Think back to the means versus ends stuff. This is, this is why I've emphasized throughout the crash course of ethical theory that the whys can matter as much as the whats. So when it comes to the stakeholder theory as an ethical theory and as a theory of management, it says similar things, right? This concern for the interests of those who are affected by the business. But the mandate for doing so when it's as a theory of management is for the purpose of maximizing profit, right? Um, that the most effective managers are going to do that. But that wouldn't make room for social responsibility because anything that would be a concern for the interests of stakeholders that doesn't work for maximizing profit would not be effective management under this kind of proposal. And Hasanas is right that um, the stakeholder theory as a theory of management has some currency. It's thrown around quite a bit in the business world. Um, uh, from everything I've seen, that, that I've seen reflections of that, and I'm not even involved in the business world that intimately. Um, but the, the, the stakeholder theory in the context of this debate is as an ethical theory. And it's presenting a slightly different twist on this theory of management by saying managers should have a balanced concern for the interests of all those who affect or are affected by the business and in ways that don't always mean working for the benefit of the company. 
So their social responsibility is built in that sometimes concern for other stakeholders will mean sacrificing company profits. So very simple example here. Um, what if a manager decides to change the operation of the business to be reflective of concern to the environment? It may not be the thing that makes sense for the bottom line of the company, but it might be a way to respect the interests of other stakeholders, that is like the people who live in the community where the business operates that are subject to pollution, right? Or maybe even people that are not in the immediate community but are in the global community. Um, I, I have uh, gotten a little bit more into environmental ethics and exploring the, war, the, the sort of state of affairs with things like global warming and stuff like that. And a lot more economists have gotten in on that conversation in the last 10 years, especially the UN Council, um, the, the Committee uh, for Climate Change. Um, that's been commissioned and been operating for about 15 years, about 15, 20 years. Um, they've gotten more economists in the story recently, and they're all talking about like, well, when these environmental impacts hit, these are going to be the economic costs. And guess where most of the economic costs are going to be happening? Not first world countries, <laughs> right? So a, a business manager that was running, say, a company in the United States, that's running stakeholder theory as an ethical theory might say, hey, there are these other people that aren't even in our country that are going to be affected by the way our business operates. And I need to take that into account in figuring out what is ethical practice um, for how I manage this company. Okay, So the ethical theory basically bakes in social responsibility by saying there are other priorities here other than the purposes that are mandated by the stockholders or the owners of the firm. Um, other people's interests matter here too, not just the interests of the stockholders. And they have to balance those considerations. Now, like I've been emphasizing before, the responsibility to the owners and the stockholders is included in that. They are stakeholders. They can be affected by the outcome of, the biz of how the business is run. But for the stakeholder theory, they're just one stakeholder among many, and they have to be balanced out. Okay. Um, and even when concern for these other stakeholders does kind of converge with the interests of maximizing profits for the stockholders, what the stakeholder theory is saying is the why here is that the reason to do it is not because of maximizing profits for the stakeholders, but out of a concern for what happens to these other stakeholders intrinsically, independently, okay? Kind of like how if I do something nice for somebody else or there's something that benefits them, um, but my only goal is because I'm getting something selfishly out of it, that action might be the thing that morality would tell me to do, but not for the reason of the selfishness, right? It just might be that selfishness and altruistic moral imperatives converge in what behavior, right? Um, but in other cases, they'll diverge. And that's why we're making this distinction between stakeholder theory as an ethical theory and as a theory of management. In those cases, they will recommend different things since the management theory is still just interested in maximizing profit as the end. And the ethical theory is taking up the interests of other stakeholders as ends in themselves, okay? And that is connected to why um, stakeholder theory the way Hasnas is going to present it, he's going to start by talking about Kant's third formulation, the categorical imperative, about respecting other people as uh, ends in themselves and not simply as a means. But before we get there, let's think about um, how to articulate this thesis of the stakeholder theory. And Hasnas gives us two versions. And I want to emphasize it because in Hasnas's arguments to come, in evaluating the stakeholder theory, sometimes I think he is guilty of only really taking seriously one of these definitions and not both of them. And it's going to contribute to what I think is a pretty significant blind spot in his analysis of stakeholder theory, but I'll get to that in a second. So here's two quotes from the reading. Um, one way to articulate might be this principle of corporate legitimacy. The corporation should be managed for the benefit of its stakeholders. This is like a thesis of stakeholder theory. Its customers, suppliers, owners, employees, and local communities, and maybe also international communities. The rights of these groups must be ensured, and further, the groups must participate, in some sense, in decisions that substantially affect their welfare. 
Or you could talk about it as a stakeholder fiduciary principle. Another use of the fiduciary concept, but not applied restricted only to the stockholders, but to other stakeholders too. Management bears a fiduciary relationship to stakeholders and to the corporation as an abstract entity. So a balancing act here, right? It must act in the interests of the stakeholders as their agent, as if they were an agent to those people. And it must act in the interest of the corporation to ensure the survival of the firm, safeguarding the long-term stakes of each group. And this is an interesting point, again, about the whys behind the whats. Ensuring the survival of the firm could be mandated under this kind of stockholder theory of fiduciary duty to stockholders, right? I need to ensure the firm's success so that people continue to receive a return on their investment. But the way that this thesis is pa painting it is that the survival of the firm is, firm is not just relevant because of how its survival affects the investors, something Boatwright's going to talk quite a lot about, but also in terms of how these other stakeholders are invested in the, con in the firm's continued success or existence, that the firm can provide a service or product to the consumers, that if it went away, then they don't get that anymore. Or uh, the way in which it can um, say like a, when a big company um, comes into a town that that also stimulates the surrounding economy too and if that company dissolved then people would be out of jobs other ancillary businesses would go away think about like um, restaurants popping up around Amazon or something like that right because now you got the Amazon employees there so they need to eat and that makes for other business opportunities that kind of stuff um, sort of the logic behind bailing out banks in the 2008 housing collapse is like the, the whole idea of too big to fail right if they fail then it's not just that the people have invested in those banks are out of luck but it's going to have a ripple effect to a lot of other people's welfare as well okay not to say that that was necessarily justified but that was the rationale offered the ethical rationale offered so hasnas really spends a lot of time on this one and focuses on this idea of how stakeholders have to participate in decisions that affect their welfare and that's where he gets the idea of this concern for from Kant about respecting people's autonomy their ability to have agency in what happens to them the self-determination thing taken externally and not just about internal control of their own will um, but I think he ignores the relevance of this other uh, fiduciary way of talking about stakeholder theory as being something that rightfully informs the choices of managers. Okay, next we got to get into um, how how would this be defended? Where, what could be the uh, ethical justification for managers adopting a policy of this type for making their decisions? Sorry for the change in lighting and scenery. <laughs> My parents showed up, so I got delayed finishing up this video. But let's get back into it. We're talking about um, the support for the stakeholder theory now. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, I think Hasnas uh, misses out on um, a big possible option for how the stakeholder theory can justify itself. Um, but let's take a look at what Hasnas first says. And he, he tries to get something out of the way initially, which is what he calls these non-rational reasons for popularity. The, one that I, the point that I think he makes here that's legitimate is this concern about the spillover from the success of the managerial theory. So people confusing the managerial theory with the ethical theory, and because the managerial thing is so great and people talk about it all the time, uh, they just sort of slide into thinking then there are these ethical responsibilities that are connected with very similar types of principles and ideas and concepts that you get from the managerial theory. And that that's fine. That might eliminate some of the noise in the intuition signals here. But then he also complains about and this struck me as very weird uh, that um, the fact that the stakeholder theory accords with our moral intuitions is also like noise for uh, he treats it as noise in the same sort of way um, and this seems really strange uh, to me because as I say here in my lecture notes um, intuitions may give us good reasons for thinking that something is is morally obligatory or that there's a moral concern here to be sensitive to. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's silly for Hasnas to complain about this since he's using moral <laughs> intuitions throughout the rest of the article. Um, and that's going to be part of his appeal for his kind of two cents he's going to throw in here at the end of the article. 
So he can't complain about intuitions here if he's using them elsewhere as providing actual justification. So that's a little strange. Um, many people would say the fact that stakeholder theory fits with our moral intuitions is actually a plus for it. Now, as we talked about with especially Kant and Mill, um, intuitional appeals can be fallible and we can be skeptical about them because they may be um, embodying some bias rather than a sensitivity to a true moral phenomenon or some like part of trying to capture the moral landscape. Um, and I, and I, so I, I'm, might have mentioned before, I'm kind of an anti-intuitionist in my own thinking about ethics uh, in that I am very skeptical about them and I'm looking for something more substantial. But even an anti-intuitionist kind of like myself will still admit that moral intuitions can be leads here to pursue and that uh, kind of like my attitude about the emotions and their role that they can play in um, rational discourse. So for for Hasnaz to dismiss this is does seem to me a little hypocritical given the way he utilizes intuitions elsewhere. So with that out of the way, the main thing that Hasnaz gets to here is some justification based on Kant's theory. And if you remember, the third formulation of the categorical imperative is the one about treating people as ends instead of simply as a means. Um, so, and, and it is you know, this is where the backdrop of ethical theory shows up in business ethics theories, that um, if there are general moral principles that that have this necessity to them, they're going to apply unconditionally into every scenario, including the scenario of business. Um, so this respect for persons thing, um, the treating people as ends in themselves, entails a respect for people's autonomy, um, as we talked about before with Kant. Um, and since this is impractical in the sense that like a, a, a manager can't go around and talk to every single stakeholder, any person who would possibly be affected by the operation of the business and get their two cents, what we do instead is treat them as a fiduciary, that the manager will act on their behalf, right? Um, just the same way that happens in the stockholder theory too. I mean, managers aren't always calling up the board of directors or much less every single stockholder to figure out what they think about this. Um, again, more on that with Boatwright. Boatwright's going to make a big deal out about that too. But here's Hasnas's reply to this. Um, oh, oh, uh, let me make one more connection here though. So the stakeholder theory is saying the manager needs to be thinking about the interests of everyone who could be affected. And um, the sort of the reason for this is under Kant's formulation of the third, uh, the third formulation of the categorical imperative, you just can't treat people simply as a means. And it's very possible that the stakeholders, in other words, the people that would be affected by the operation of the business, may be considered, like in the managerial uh, stakeholder theory, without necessarily um, uh, treating them as an end in themselves, right? That they're being considered, but just for the impact that's going to have on the company's profits. And that would be to treat them as a means. They're just another mechanism that's a part of this profit generation scheme of the business. Stakeholder theory under a justification from Kant is saying the moral mandate for being concerned about those stakeholders is to prevent treating them merely as a means and thus disrespecting them morally. Okay, that's the big concern there. So if you're going to use, say, employees as a means for the company to make profits, that's okay as long as they're not treated simply as a means, right? And having some kind of concern for their own interests is important here. So that might lead a manager to um, pay their employees better, even though they could get away with paying them less given market conditions, um, or providing other kinds of benefits, or um, things like child care support, maternity or paternity leave, things of that kind of nature that are uh, policies that are aimed directly at benefiting the employees for their own sake, right? A concern about what's happening for them for their own sake. Uh, and even if that overlaps with things like being able to uh, attract better employees to work for that company, that can't be the reason why it's being done. Um, as we talked about before, there are going to be cases in which those two uh, imperatives, the profit maximizing imperative 
and the respect for persons will diverge. And under stakeholder theory, even when they diverge, you have to be concerned about these people kind of for their own sake, to take their interests into account in how the company is managed. So here's Hasnas's reply. He says that respect for persons only gets us as far as requiring that no one be coerced into dealing with the business without their consent. And that, if that was the only moral mandate that the categorical imperative required, then I think Hasnas is right that that wouldn't get to a justification of the robustness of the responsibilities that the, stock, the stakeholder theory puts on the manager. Now, I have a little reply here myself, a little comment on this, that I, I think this is a suspect argument. We talked a little bit in class how respect for persons does need to be cashed out. Like, what does that actually mean? Um, and Hasnas' interpretation, I just want to remark, is the most minimal interpretation of what it means to respect persons. And I offered some of my own thoughts on how to understand what where this is going to go for Kant that's going to have a more robust conception of what those obligations are. It can't just be that I'm not going to interfere with your autonomy, but also about promoting it and being concerned about people as being an object of intrinsic value to be positively concerned about rather than just negatively concerned about. Um, the, the case examples that Hasnas appeals to, which are appeals to intuitions, going back to my point about his hypocrisy, I, I think they're a little cherry picked if you go back to that about like the students and the Republican stuff like those are scenarios that may fit where the in where the the most morally relevant feature in those scenarios is a concern about um, a lack of consent or some kind of coercion. But there are other cases too that aren't maybe the, that isn't going to be the thing that in that case really stands out as the most morally relevant feature. Um, okay, so. Um, bottom line here, um, Hasnas is highlighting how we can't just take it for granted because a decision affects a person, the person has a right to have a say in that decision. That's another big, big point that he wants to make. But I think that this whole way of approaching the stakeholder theory using Kant, where I'm like, it's not like I don't think Kant doesn't apply to this or something. But if you're thinking about a way for the stakeholder theory to justify why a manager needs to be concerned about anyone who could be affected by the operation of the business, Kant is not the first thing I would think about. The first one I'd think about is utilitarianism or some kind of consequentialist theory. Because for a utilitarian, anyone who could be affected by your actions is morally relevant in the decision making, just in virtue of their vulnerability you might say to the possible benefits or detriments that your actions could take um, it's the mere fact that someone could be affected that sets the moral mandate for being concerned about them under a utilitarian framework so um, it's not just about these deontic duties of uh, like these minimal requirements about respect for autonomy or something it's also about just doing the most good um, if you're a utilitarian stakeholder theory is going to feel like a really natural extension of the theory applied into the business world. Um, and I think that that connection is what's probably behind that intuitive support that Hostas was complaining about, about how stakeholder theory aligns with more, our moral intuitions. If we have moral intuitions for utilitarianism, where it's like there's a moral demand to make the most good happen in the world, stakeholder theory gives a pretty straightforward and robust way of understanding an extension of that moral intuition. Um, so I think going back here to these two uh, principles of stakeholder theory, this one that um, uh, talks about the the groups must participate, that does sound more Kantian. Um, but this part here, just acting in the interests of stakeholders as their agent, like making decisions with an eye to how they'll be affected. But by Hasnas focusing on this first one rather than the second one, I think he misses the utilitarian connection here. But I, I think that I hope that that reads right off the page for you or just with my comments here. If you want to talk about it more, we can do that. But um, that's a that's a big, big oversight that I saw here in how um, like Hasnas does a really good job here in the way that he structures the paper of being sensitive to the need for any of these business the ethical theories to shoulder their burden of proof about why they're justified. 
And a lot of the justifications for moral positions in a more applied context like business are going to come from the justifications that come from these other broader moral theories that like deliver a moral mandate for something and how they argue for that. So I really appreciate how Hasnas is tracking the burden of proof considerations, but I think sometimes he drops the ball a little bit on this. Um, so I'm trying to just supplement his discussion here with some of my own comments. The final theory that we have to take a look at here is the social contract theory. And let's do a whole lot of talking about the what of it first. Hasnas doesn't do a very deep dive into the justification here, and, and he addresses it, but it, like I said, this doesn't take a very deep dive into it. And I think the impression Hasnas gives is that social contract theory appears kind of like an arbitrary picture or moral vision that stands in need of a justification, which it doesn't provide. And I think he's short selling it. Um, but let's let's first just talk about the the what of social contract theory because it's a little more complicated than the other two theories. Uh, it's a little more elaborate. As I mentioned before, the idea of the social contract. Uh, first kind of shows up in philosophy in a discussion of governments, which are ultimately social institutions. They're systems of social cooperation. They're, there's a structure there of rules and consequences that are artificially constructed by people participating in those systems in a society. Um, governments don't have uh, some kind of self-giving authority. <laughs> um, and so they, there's a question here about when and where uh, do they actually have legitimate moral authority. We've talked before about how like the law can't define what's right and wrong. The law is subject to moral demands. Otherwise we couldn't have a, a sensible notion of just and unjust laws, for example, or when a government is doing something abusive or oppressive or something like that. Um, if it was able to give itself its own authority, then such a thing wouldn't be possible, and it obviously is possible. So there needs to be a higher court of appeal here. And the social contract theory is trying to do that. Um, the basic idea here applied to the business world is that, well, if social contract theory works for governments, which are social institutions, well, businesses are social institutions too. They're systems of cooperation. Um, and they, uh, they have this constructed institutional status. Um, and whether it's for governments or for businesses, part of what's going to happen here with social contract theory is not assuming that these social institutions have legitimacy as the default. It's not innocent until proven guilty here. It's actually guilty until proven innocent. There are special conditions that a institution needs to be satisfying in order for it to be deserving of other people's respect and participation. That basically society allows an institution to exist as long as that institution is kind of fulfilling its end of the bargain of this social contract. So um, that's what I'm saying here about how businesses or governments have no intrinsic legitimacy but gain this legitimacy from their status of fulfilling these other conditions. So it's kind of the, it is an imaginary story here. And social contract theorists are explicit about this, as Hasnas points out. Um, it's not like when you're born, let's say you were born in the United States, maybe you weren't, but let's just say um, you were born in, in this country, and so you are a U.S. citizen. It's not like a, by becoming a U.S. citizen where you're now subject to all the laws of the United States government that you agreed to that. <laughs> right? It's not like you like signed a contract and the government is like, we promised this and you're like, I promised this. But imagine it like that is what the social contract theory is saying. That that metaphor captures what is morally significant here about social institutions like governments or like businesses. That um, the institution promises to fulfill the requirements of welfare and justice, which we'll talk about in a second here, and in return, the people agree to allow them to exist and to basically play by their rules. Um, if the government or business uh, violates these requirements on their end of the contract, it like renders the contract null and void. Just like if a real contract happened where there's terms of that contract and if one party 
violates their terms, then that then the contract itself loses its authority. The other party is now no longer bound to their promises if the other side is not fulfilling theirs. That's the basic idea here. So what are these conditions that are um, restrictive on the legitimacy of an institution? Well, the first part's about welfare. It's basically a, a kind of promise that um, the institution is going to work to the benefit of society. Kind of think about it like like uh, Hosnas describes with social contracts, like why would a society allow this institution to exist in the first place? And there are really good reasons for doing that. Um, systems of cooperation, like social institutions, have a lot of benefits that they can possibly offer to the people who participate in them. Um, when it comes to businesses, there's a lot of benefits to consumers, employees, but also ways in which there could be possible harms here. So there, there is a positive motivation for allowing these things to exist as long as they're making those things happen. But if they don't, now they're in violation of that term. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of the details of this, but there are uh, quite a lot. And I think for the most part, these things read off the page. If you have some particular questions about the details, though, that'd be something I would love to be able to answer for you. So don't be shy about asking about that. When it comes to the justice term here, the, it's a really simple requirement that even if the institution is like making benefit happen, if it's doing that at the expense of like respecting people's basic rights of justice, then that's not right. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the concern about civil rights, respect for autonomy, fairness, honesty, like truth seeking kind of stuff, avoiding fraud and deception, respecting their workers as human beings. Um, avoid discriminatory practices like the systematically worsens the situation of a given group in society those would all be violations of justice um, so that can't happen okay so the government or business needs to be respecting these moral minimums of justice like Kantian sorts of obligations but then it also has this kind of consequentialist or utilitarian component to it as well and and this, I, I, it might be worth pointing out that the social contract theory is not uh, picking and choosing which of these big moral theories is the one right one. It's a little bit more pluralistic. It's like, yeah, we care about consequences, the way that utilitarianism describes, and we care about these sort of minimum <laughs> concerns about justice, too. Um, so we, we, they kind of combine both of them. And I was describing before in our crash course how you can do that. I mean, you can you can integrate uh, these different parts of the moral landscape that those different theories uh, provide. Um, it's not automatically wrong to do that or contradictory or anything like that. Okay, so what are the concerns about this theory? Um, this sort of guilty until proven innocent or that there isn't inherent legitimacy to a business, that it has that it, it gets its legitimacy from the people in society that it's supposed to serve. Well, the first concern here is just about how it's not really a contract. It's an imaginary thing. So we've got three sort of forms of contracts. Um, Azas is pulling this from law, but this is a part of moral theory too. It's like just these logically possible ways in which to understand a contract. An explicit contract would be like you and another party like sign it, right? It's like a legally binding document, some kind of public statement about it that's explicit about what's being promised and what's not. But you also have implicit contracts, and the law recognizes this too. There's there's sort of informal agreements that usually, um, I mean, it's a, the burden of proof for proving that this is happening is a little higher than in an explicit case. The explicit case just like makes it straightforward. Like you sign the deed to your house over to somebody else, you know, it's like pretty clear what's going on there. Or like power of attorney or something like that. But in implicit contracts, even though it's fuzzier, there, there is uh, parameters in our actual legal system for respecting this. Um, it usually has to do with like patterns of behavior, um, where you don't have to like continually write more contracts every time you want to engage with someone. But if there's some established precedent here about how these parties engage with each other, um, there, under certain conditions, that can amount to uh, an implicit contract that then still puts the parties under some obligations. But then there's this third thing, a quasi-contract, which is what the social contract is. It's just a metaphor. Uh, quasi-contracts aren't getting the, their moral force from 
respecting promise making and promise keeping. It's more like saying, like what the social contract theory is really proposing is that if you want to understand the moral dimensions to this relationship, see it as if a contract had been made. That's what it means to say it's a quasi-contract. It's just a metaphorical way of understanding what is morally relevant in the, in the interaction. Okay, and that's okay. I mean, you can do this sort of thing. It does mean, though, there's a, that there's this hanging question about where do you get the justification for this? Why buy into that fictional story about a, a contract that's never actually been made? Right. So, um, one idea about how it could happen is by talking about the authority of consent and the basically the promise making, promise keeping thing. Um, but that can't be the basis of social contract theory, as the way Hasnas points out from this other philosopher named Donaldson, um, that it's it's true that a social contract can't get its moral authority just as a derivative of the agreements people have actually made. Because the whole point here is to be able to hold those agreements to some kind of accountability. Is that agreement one that is morally appropriate to be made? Um, so even if like citizens agree to respect the laws of an unjust government, they shouldn't, right? If they don't take Locke's advice here about civil disobedience, then they're doing something wrong. Even if so, even if they consent, it wouldn't make it right. Um, okay, so. If consent can't be used to justify a social contract theory, then what else, right? And so I make a note here. I say, it isn't like the social contract theory is in any particularly bad position. Every theory is in the boat of requiring a justification for its proposal. And we've talked about how the other two theories might possibly do that. Um, but <clears throat> there's, there's still options here for what a social contract theory can say. And that's why I'm saying Hasnas isn't going as doing as deep of a dive into this as I think he really ought to because there are plenty of ways in which social contract theories have tried to give a argument for this. I mean one big one is Kant because the categorical imperative doesn't require that people actually agree to it. For me to like respect other people's autonomy doesn't demand this. And the way, if you have a more robust sense of the categorical imperative that has this, like, what I've described as Kantian care or obligations to be concerned about the interests of these things, were, people that we're saying have intrinsic value to them, then you've got a nice basis here for a social contract that people can't be expected to participate in a system of cooperation that isn't concerned about them, that is treating them as a means instead of acknowledging their dignity as an end in themselves. That would be a pretty straightforward to try, a way of trying to justify the social contract, and that's what we're going to see with a really famous social contract theorist later in this quarter named John Rawls, who I think I've mentioned before to you. Uh, Rawls is going to be doing an updating of a kind of Kantian argument applied to social justice. Um, Rawls is a 20th century, mid 20th century philosopher, so he's, he's more recent. Um, but it, it goes back to similar arguments you get from Kant. Um, so yeah, I say it completely ignores the Rawlsian justification here. There's this other stuff about the extant social contract. I, I don't want to go into this um, directly. Uh, th there's some details here. You can take a, a look at my lecture notes, but um, I, I want to kind of keep moving this through so we can get through this lecture. Um, I do want to, I, I think maybe this comment's worth me mentioning a couple things about. So. Going back to this idea about consent, the authority of consent, Hasnas is going to make a big deal out of this in his own two cents in this whole topic that he throws in at the end of the paper. Um, but he says that this is obvious and necessarily binding, but he hasn't advanced that w with an argument behind it. Um, that He's really just appealing to an intuition here, and that's okay, you know, especially, like I say, if we're just learning the theories and figuring out what their commitments are. Um, before like deciding which one we think. Um, but here, it, to, to sort of treat uh, the social contract theory as if it's got all of its eggs in this basket of consent, I think is misleading. Um, there are other ways to justify it, um, other than to talk about the sort of intuition of uh, consent as, a, where is this here, that's involved in explicit or implicit contracts. Um, okay, so it's some. I'm, what I'm trying to do is 
maybe I should turn my hat for this. Hosnas kind of makes it into like he's he's dropping truth bombs or something like revealing like pulling back the curtain on the social contract theory and realizing oh it's just you know like wizard of oz thing it's just a fantasy it's just this kind of fictional vision as if it has no ability to offer some justification behind it and and that's just not the case um it, it even if uh i could pull one other intuition here um this intuition definitely is present in American culture with the kind of, um, maybe you've noticed the way Americans are somewhat um, skeptical of their government. <laughs> they, and they always have been. I mean, the part of the context of the Revolutionary War against Britain is that they're, you know, the, the people who are even designing the Constitution here for the United States are concerned about the way in which governments can become ends in themselves when that is inappropriate that the government has all of its moral obligations to the citizens, and when it's no longer working for them, it's lost its legitimacy. Um, that government systems don't exist as ends in themselves. If they're good, it's because of what they're doing for people in society. Um, they aren't more important than the people. I mean, the founding fathers of America are really adamant about this point. And all that the social contract theory applied as a business ethic theory is saying is that businesses are the same way. You don't live to exist to promote the business. The business exists to promote people, the value of people. You might have noticed that all of the ethical theories that we've studied, especially the ones that talk about justice explicitly, like Kant and Mill, um, the, the, where the buck stops for moral end is with people, either the kind of egalitarian concern that Mill and utilitarians have for people's happiness, um, that that's the sort of end result of everything, or for Kant, the kind of respecting the dignity of people. Um, that's always where the buck stops for these big moral theories. There isn't a moral theory that's like, people should be basically slaves to these institutions. It's, no, the institutions should be serving the people, if they're going to be morally legitimate. And when they stop doing that, they've lost their legitimacy. So I think that's a that's a basic moral intuition we can have about the moral status of intuitions that social contract theory fits really neatly into. So even if we didn't get any, into anything more theoretically sophisticated than that, that is still something that's worth pointing out about how the social contract theory might try to justify itself. So that it, it's capturing that part of the moral reality accurately. Okay, so getting into Hasnas's final two cents here. Hasnas thinks that he's picked out a common denominator in this debate. So he's been laying out all these different options and talking about the kind of pros and cons, like what can they say to defend themselves, where do people have concerns and objections against them. And he's like, in looking at that debate and trying to resolve that controversy, you see this idea, the, the moral respect for consent showing up all over the place. So it's, it's really obvious in stockholder theory um, about respecting this free agreement that's made between the owners of the business and the managers that they hire to work for them um, and that in order to respect that you can't have all these other social responsibilities so it's showing up there in the stakeholder theory as Hasnas presented it the main moral concern is about this importance of people's ability to control their lives their own autonomy here um, and that also involves this like consent, like non-coercive relationship. Um, and then the social contract theory, uh, the connection is that he thinks um, if we didn't have respect, if we didn't have this like intuitive respect for consent as morally relevant, then the whole idea of using a contract, even just as a metaphor to describe the moral situation of our relationship with institutions like businesses or governments, wouldn't make sense. Okay. So I, I've got some replies about this. Um, when it comes to, uh, I mean, Hasnas tries to be explicit here in saying that he's not just going stockholder theory, rah, rah, right? He, he's like, it's somewhat inadequate too. It doesn't under, acknowledge how ethical obligations from non-business sphere interact with the obligations from within the business sphere. So you've got these consensual relationships between managers and stockholders, but what about the other consensual relationships that are involved? like the consensual relationships between consumers and the company, 
or the employees and the company, the people who aren't the managers, or the way that they exist qua employee as opposed to qua fiduciary who have power uh, in controlling what happens with the company, or the people who live in, in society that don't directly interface with the business but can still be affected by it. Um, those are not acknowledged in the stockholder theory according to Hasna, so that's kind of like a blind spot, he thinks. Um, it's capturing some stuff about consent, but not all the consent relationships that matter. Um, I, I've already talked about how um, there are other ways for the stakeholder theory uh, to understand the moral mandate, like I was giving that consequentialist or utilitarian way that they might justify themselves. And that could be a way of understanding this protecting interests that doesn't necessarily involve this giving a say thing, which is what would be relevant for a consent idea, uh, to treat consent as morally important. And then even here with the um, social contract theory, um, and this is something Rawls is going to make a big deal about when we get to him, uh, it's not just about consent. It's about an idealized consent. Consent under the appropriate circumstances is the one that's actually going to be morally legitimate. That's what's that's what social contracts really saying. Um, <clears throat> it, like I said, it's not going to derive its authority based on the actual agreements that we make, but the agreements that we ought to make with each other. And those agreements uh, that we ought to make should be happening from a position that doesn't involve any kind of coercive influence in this. Um, there's going to be, oh man, I'm really tempted to get into it right now and go on this tangent, um, but it's something we're going to be getting into definitely as the quarter keeps going. But let me just put the bee in your bonnet right now. When we think about wanting to respect people's free choices, um, we can think about that freedom in a couple of different ways. One sense is like, you get to decide, take it or leave it, here's my offer, right? You get to decide. I'm not putting a gun to your head. I'm not, you know, blackmailing you in order to get you to sign this contract with me or something like that. So that level of a lack of coercion is present. But you can also think about coercion as operating in a different dimension where people, because of their circumstances, might be compelled to agree freely to something, but something that they wouldn't otherwise agree to. For example, Let's say we're in a huge recession and no one has jobs and everyone needs to be able to like put food on the table, right? And I'm a factory owner and I've got a bunch of jobs and I know the demand for jobs is high. So I offer really low wages knowing that people will freely agree. I'm not chaining them to the factory floor. They can quit whenever they want. But I'm like able to leverage my power position over people to get them to freely consent to things that otherwise under other circumstances they wouldn't agree to. Is that a moral concern? Which notion of coercion is the one that's really morally relevant? Or both? Maybe both are relevant. That's a big debate we'll be getting into. And this, this kind of goes back to um, what I was saying about what, how Hasnas is understanding the third formulation of the categorical imperative. I mean, how robust of an obligation is it to respect people's autonomy? Is it just I don't interfere with their autonomy through, like, putting a gun to someone's head kind of thing? Or is it that I also need to be doing these positive things to promote their autonomy and their ability to be self-determining rather than just exploiting their lack of power, right? Um, not forcing them to do it, but knowing that they're going to freely give it up, right? Or give up the things that they would otherwise choose. This is something that really motivates Rawls, and he's thinking as long as there are these power dynamics that are conditioning the consent, it doesn't have the full moral authority that it that um, would be helping us guide how things ought to happen. That what Rawls thinks is how things ought to happen would be based on what we'd agree to if we were kind of all equals. And he's got a very interesting way <clears throat> of setting up that situation which doesn't require us all being the same and it's going to have to do with this veil of ignorance with the the way in which we're all different but if we don't know who we are then we can't factor that into our decision making about what we'd agree to and what we wouldn't agree to so um, I, I've given some sneak previews of Rawls before but 
uh, we're going to dive into that in, in much greater detail later in the quarter. So stay tuned about that. But this, this stuff about consent and what's really respecting of people's freedom is um, going to be important. And it might be something that you're already sensitive to and thinking about. So I wanted to just, like I said, put that bee in your bonnet in the sense of uh, if that's something you're tracking and like anticipating and waiting for us to talk about, we're definitely going to be talking about it. It is part of the moral landscape of business ethics, absolutely. Okay, and then I've got some some uh, kind of quotes from Hosnos in this last section that I want to throw at you and have you take a look at. And I said I've got a, a class activity. These are like discussion questions for um, how to get a handle on uh, Hosnos's angle, like what's his sort of argumentative ambition here, and whether he is making some assumptions that maybe are worth critically rethinking. Um, so I'll, I'll read these here, and we obviously can't have discussion right now because I'm just recording this video for you to watch later, um, but I think it's worth thinking about, and if you want to discuss it with me, I'd love to, and maybe when we see each other next, we could, uh, if, if that's something that you're like, ooh, yeah, I want to talk about that more, bring it up, and, and I think that would be worth spending some class time on too. But uh, it'll, it might help also to see how uh, Hosnos's take, especially on stakeholder theory and social contract theory, might stand in distinct contrast with what those theories might be saying about themselves as presenting a different picture rather than Hosnos's way of kind of reducing all of them to this way of trying to capture consent. I mean, what, what Hosnos, actually let me skip to the end here. Hosnos's ultimate suggestion to us is since all these different theoretical proposals are in conversation with this moral value of consent and he thinks they all might be picturing or capturing some part of the realities of consent that what remains is just us coming up with some new maybe modification of some of these theories that integrates all of these consent considerations into one big synthetic pass package um, and he says that's a pretty big project and I'm not able to give you it here. <laughs> that, like he says, this is for another time to work on. Um, but that's kind of him setting a research agenda about where our reflective efforts should go, in his opinion. That he thinks this would be a fruitful way to go about developing uh, a robust theory of business ethics. That's where he wants the conversation to go, of just how we do this balancing act between different respect for consent. Um, there might be some big assumptions there, though, and I think that's where these quotes uh, are useful to kind of reflect on. So here's one of them. Because businesses consist in nothing more, emphasis mine, than a multitude of voluntary agreements among individuals, it's entirely natural that the ethical obligations of the parties to these agreements, including those of the managers of the business, should derive from the individual consent of each. Clearly, any attempt to provide a general account of the ethical obligations of businesses and business people must ultimately rely on the moral force of an individual's freely given consent. I don't think that this is a clearly sort of case. I mean, the fact that I'm like, maybe to think anything to be suspicious of here, anything to critically rethink. But I think some of where the, what would make it clear to Hasnas is based on the way he's setting up the question. And if you ask me, the thing that I think might be worth some critical reflection is this idea that it's nothing more. We'll talk a little bit more about this um, in two contexts. One, in the whistleblowing thing we're going to do next, which is going to get into issues of employee loyalty to businesses. Um, and then this stuff with uh, Rawls and Nozick and social and economic justice in the broad scale. That maybe there, and, and um, <clears throat> with this guy named G.A. Cohen, who is a neo-Marxist, and I'm Maybe some of you are already going to be turned off to him just because of that. Uh, but Cohen, I think, is a very reasonable contemporary Marxist um, and very accessible and very much willing to engage with his opponents charitably here. But all of those topics that we'll discuss later are going to sort of see things as maybe a little bit more complicated than just these atomistic voluntary agreements of this transaction, this transaction, this transaction that's all done bet between free parties that freely consent to it. There could be some more dimensions here that might make that more morally problematic than the way that Hasnas is, is kind of setting it up in this very clean way. 
So maybe you might have some thoughts about that too, of like what else might need to get into the picture here to understand just what is happening with businesses. And then he says this, if businesses are merely, again, emphasis mine, merely, voluntary associations of individuals, then the ethical obligations of business people will be the ethical obligations individuals incur by joining voluntary associ associations. So it's again him kind of saying this moral stuff about consent is the sort of general thing that even outside of business we think is morally binding and so it should also apply within the context of business. And then he says there is no point in time at which the collection of individuals that constitutes a business is magically transformed into a new separate and distinct entity that is endowed with rights or laden with obligations not possessed by the individual human beings that comprise it. So with all these quotes, you might be sensing a pattern here that for Hasnas, the complexities of business are really just aggregated individual relationships of these like little moments of free consent of how people interact with each other. Okay? And that's the thing you might be suspicious of. But also, just with when he talks about this idea of a business magically transforming into a new separate and distinct entity, we're definitely going to pick that up with whistleblowing. But also, I, I, as I say in this comment here, um, legally, this is exactly what's happened with corporations. That under United States law, businesses are people. And they have the same kinds of rights that citizens have. Um, but we might say, and I think this is an important caveat, without some of the responsibilities that citizens have. And there's some asymmetry there. And it, I remember when, um, when I think there was a Supreme Court ruling about this too, about kind of baptizing businesses into these people that they have these um, rights and privileges that are similar to what citizens have. I was kind of like, what? I, was, I personally was very surprised by this. Um, and what would be the logic behind doing this? Um, maybe Hasnas would disagree with that uh, legal decision. But uh, like I said, it's at least hotly contested. The fact that it's happened shows that there's some impetus for treating them that way. Now, it might just be lobbying interests, right, that the businesses want to gain kind of more legal protections um, and advance their concerns with, profit maximizing by taking advantage of that. But um, anything that happens in United States laws that gets upheld by courts is not, I, I think, you can't just be dismissed in this kind of cynicism about politics. Their uh, judges are, they're not just lawyers. They're closer to philosophers in some respects that they're thinking about the big picture here, not just what's expedient right now, but if we make this ruling, what else, what other possibilities does that set up? And even if you disagree with some court rulings, there, there's going to be some kind of justifying argument. It might be a rationalization. I, I wouldn't, you know, I'm not going to say all the, 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 the court decisions are free of these other kinds of biases or something like that. But that there's something here that makes this a rational controversy, I think that is fair. Any issue that goes before higher courts is going to have um, some dimensions to it that way. And that's why you see, like, I don't know if you've ever read Supreme, Supreme Court rulings or something like that. Um, part of the practice is to have dissenting opinions so people recognize, hey, it, the decision went this way, but it's not like we're dismissing the concerns on the other side. That, they're, that um, the opportunity for dissenting opinions is for those other judges that didn't rule that way to basically say why they didn't and have that be a part of the story, even if here's the ruling that that's now going to be given on that issue. Um, hey, there, there's a reason why it got all the way to the Supreme Court, because it isn't obvious. right? And we want to be tracking that dialectic, that complexity, rather than just we make this ruling and then forget about whatever position we that was dismissed. Uh, or that didn't get the favorable ruling for its side. There's a part of a conversation there. There's a respect for controversy and disagreement that, that is still a structural part of our legal system, um, even if it doesn't always work the way that maybe it ought to. Okay, so um, that's what I got to say about Hasnas.
Um, I think I, I was kind of thinking about maybe starting Friedman a little bit in this video, but we're pretty close to two hours, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna call it a day. Um, the schedule has Friedman and Boat Right for Thursday, so uh, we'll do that. Uh, 260 students, uh, I'll be talking to you in person, and 360 students, it'll be another video lecture here. But especially especially for 360 students, as I said before, since we we aren't able to see each other at all this week, not until next Tuesday. Um, a week from tomorrow. Um, I'm recording this Monday night. Um, I really, really encourage you to get in contact with me. And uh, if you want to talk, or especially if you have questions about this lecture since you weren't able to ask them in class, um, I really would love to talk to all of you more. Um, I'm a little behind on journal entries, and, I, and I've been trying to get some conversation going by giving comments to journals. Um, but uh, it's a very laborious way to do it like typing up all these comments some of you have maybe have noticed how like extensive some of my re <laughs> comment reactions have been to some of your journals um, I I've, in those cases I've usually said some kind of apology for how long my comment is but um, it's kind of anticipating a lot of opportunity for discussion and processing and chewing on this stuff and, and I'd love to see that happen some more and the most efficient way to do it is definitely talking on the phone or talking in person um, but I'll, I'll keep trying to get some comments out on the journals as I'm able to get through them. Um, but but if you if you're like, well, I said what I wanted to say in the journal. Um, don't wait for me to reply if there's something you really want to talk about, because that uh, the time it might take for me to return a comment to you would be maybe that idea is now long gone and we're on to something different. So I do encourage you to strike while the iron is hot and uh, contact me to discuss things while you're thinking about it. Um, so I can be more immediately responsive to where you're at and, and join you in where you're at with this stuff and, and walk the path of exploring all this material together. Um, that's uh, my dream about being a teacher is to do that. That's my favorite thing about it, to be with you where you're at, like chewing on this stuff and to be a, a kind of a sidekick or I guess a, um, maybe sometimes a guide, but more more just like participating in it with you. That's that's my favorite thing about teaching. So I know I'm going to be a broken record about this, but uh, so I'll probably say this stuff again, but um, please uh, don't don't be shy if you can. If you are shy, I understand, um, but I'm here and very much excited. Every time a student calls me, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yes, this is cool. Rather than like oh, another phone call to talk, that's not my experience about it at all. Okay, um, until next time, until Thursday. I oh boy, I just remember, I forgot, I remembered, I forgot, I remembered again. Um, what's gonna be the code word? What do I got around here? Um, uh, Oh, here we go. Okay. Here's a thing in my vicinity. I should wear this more often than I do. There we go. Starfleet is the code for tonight. I'm a big Star Trek fan. I got this nice communicator pin. Um, Starfleet, that's the code word. Put that into the quiz. Um, those of you in the 260 class, we've done this once before. I know this is not the regular uh, way you do stuff with us, but... Um, I'm going to have a code up like we did before, uh, a quiz up on Canvas again for you to register that you watched this video uh, and got through the whole thing. And I'll just ask you to answer that question what's the code word with the answer Starfleet? That's the code word. Okay, I'll see you on Thursday, one way or another.